Let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the, the status and, and the putative breakdown of the blue social model uh, today. Uh, you've written that um, uh, the blue vision of the future I is bleak um, since uh, it points to a world in which, quote, most of the population will be economically surplus, unquote, and globalization and automation will empower uh, a creative class on Wall Street, Hollywood, and Silicon Valley, but everyone else will be, quote, stuck in low productivity, low wage jobs as manufacturing fades and is replaced by nothing unless you count government benefits and food stamps. Um, that's a pretty bleak vision. How, how, why are we facing that and to what extent um, is that a, uh, a, 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 an inevitable mm -hmm. decline? Well, I mean, I don't think it is an inevitable decline, but I think, I think a lot of people in this country do think that we're on a kind of a grim slide to, to a future that looks like, as I've written, Blade Runner with food stamps. <laughs> and, you know, and it really comes down to people see, a lot of people sort of intuitively believe if you're not making stuff, you're not doing anything, producing anything economically of value. So if you're not working in a car factory, you know, you're somebody's pool boy or something. Right. And um, so the vision, you know, and, and certainly realistically, where the American middle class became this mass, the, the large majority of our society, is you had something like 35% at the peak of the population of the workforce is in these manufacturing jobs, often though not always unionized, generally speaking, jobs for life, jobs with secure benefits, all these kinds of things. Um, and at the same time, you had all these sort of, that, that was the blue collar middle class. And the white collar middle class there were all those people pushing paper in all the companies that employed all those manufacturers and the insurance companies and so on. And this, is, this was America from the 1930s 19th, or 40s? Yeah, uh, World, World War II mm -hmm. right on up until, you know, sometime in the last generation. Right. So the 1970s and, maybe or Well, or I think that 80s. may have been in some ways the peak numerically. I think that's when manufacturing employment peaked in the U.S., as I recall. Is that right? In the yeah. 70s? Yeah. Uh, and then what you have is a combination of things like computers, suddenly like one person with an Excel spreadsheet mm -hmm. can do the, entire, the work of an entire department under the old system. Yeah. The same thing, uh, I'm old enough, I don't know if you are to remember, there would be pools of typists mm -hmm. in offices uh, just using these old you know, electric typewriters. And now you've got computers, it's, it just, you need maybe one person to do the clerical work that 25 other people used to do. In the same way with manufacturing, a lot of people look to export of jobs overseas, which has certainly happened. But it's also the case that you go into a lot of factories today and you see a lot of very smart machines. You don't see all that many people. Mm -hmm. We're actually manufacturing more stuff in America than we were in the 70s, but we don't need as many people to do it. Mm -hmm. So what that means is that for an entire generation, the balance uh, between supply and demand in the labor market has been moving in ways that are not necessarily good for labor. So wages have been, you know, have, have tended to fall or people have had long-term unemployment. Stagnated, at least. Stagnated, yeah. yep. Uh, I think in certain, I think for non-supervisory private employees, they're actually they have not gone up since the 70s. I mean, it's you know, amazing, even though productivity has gone up. So one solution would be the Luddite one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Machines, the machines, and, yes. and put up a lot of, uh, but also put up some big tariffs with China. Yes. Seems like an excellent way to make us both poor and at war. But, uh, <laughs> you know, but for some people, that's a great yeah. idea. Yeah. You know, knock yourselves out, I say. But so the question then really is, what do you do? What do those people do? Right. And the only, you know, again. And, you, and your, your, your point is that the blue model has really a very poor answer to that question. Yeah, the blue model doesn't actually have an idea. Basically, try to pump more money from failing systems. If you wanted to really 
describe, and I think this is, this is kind of the center-left democratic view right now, is that, okay, you've got Silicon Valley, you've got Hollywood, you've got a handful of these high-producing sort of money pumps. The government's job is to take the excess revenue from these places and to whether it's like, we'll, we'll tax people and then we're gonna hire the post, postal workers an email, but we will keep full lifetime employment in the post office. That's one way you recycle the excess money or you pump more money into the university system, you know, as much to create jobs as anything else. So you create pity jobs or you give people benefits and you do it by taxing the rich. And the way you get the rich to consent with this is, is two ways. One, there'll be a lot more people who don't have money and want it than, mm -hmm. than the few rich who have it. And the other will be, and you say to the rich, look, this is so much better than the guillotine, don't you think? <laughs> so, um, and, and that I think is what you're seeing in kind of blue politics right now. You make them an offer they can't refuse. <laughs> exactly right, exactly right. No, but uh, um, <clears throat> you've also written that e even uh, healthcare reform, I mean, Obamacare, for example, has, a, has as an ulterior motive uh, and as a kind of hidden implication of it, precisely redistributing money or recycling well, money it's, from... It's, it's used, well, in that case, uh, I mean, look, there, there are a number of things, I think, that, that were a number of ways in which Obamacare, despite some good intentions, doesn't get us where we need to go. And that would include, one is it really is a transfer of money from the young to the middle age. Mm -hmm. it, the way this system, for a lot of young people, the sort of rational insurance program would be some kind of catastrophic sure. care insurance. In any case, look, if you are a 22-year-old man, you have to pay very high insurance rates. Why? Because more 22-year-old men tend to get into car accidents right. than other people do. But if you're, what well, they want to turn around and tell you is if you're a 22-year-old man, you have to pay very high insurance rates. You can't, even though 22-year-old men have, don't get sick as often as, as older people, don't have as many babies as 22-year-old girls, yeah. and so on and so forth. No, you have to pay up it's, because it's not fair if you don't. Uh, I, this wouldn't be so bad if the health care system that we were building were sustainable so that, okay, when you're 22, you pay extra. When you're 55, you get a benefit. Right. But actually, the, because it doesn't really control costs, it doesn't change the way the system works in a way that means that that over time health care will be more productive and we can get better care for less money it basically means that by the time these the kids of today are ready to 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 benefit from the system they won't be able to get the same level of benefits they're subsidizing for others it is a colossal ripoff of kids and the <clears throat> and on the, there are tremendous demographic pressures coming for the welfare state and, and for the blue yep. social model. Exactly. And again, you, you know, this is part of the problem is that, you know, it is not inherent in the blue model, uh, but what happened is that between the, you know, when, when Social Security and then Medicare and so on were put on, people simply projected population growth rates out into infinity. And therefore the assumption was each generation would be as much bigger than the last mm -hmm. one as the baby boom was bigger than the generation before it. If that were true, if we were all still having four or five kids, then actually Social Security and Medicare wouldn't be in nearly the trouble that they're in. We would have some other problems, perhaps. <laughs> um, but that's not what we did. And unfortunately, um, in, you know, for, for all kinds of reasons, we didn't begin to make these changes slowly and you know, no, oh gee, the birth rate, it appears to be going down. Maybe, you know, another big issue is when Social Security was put in, you know, the retirement age was basically set at about two years before, yes. you know, in that sense, Social Security was, was originally set up to be a kind of an end of life benefit right. when you, and, and the assumption was that for most people, while you could work, you would work. Right. And we've turned it into a 20-year idleness entitlement program. Again, I don't, you know, I think that's bad morally, but I think it's also um, it's unsustainable economically, which is the real issue. So, why don't we, as a blue modeler might 
recommend just tax more highly, tax more uh, um, uh, rigorously the the super wealthy to pay for all these. Short well, and for, part of the problem is there just aren't enough super wealthy. You know, you can when a society is having sort of a temporary adjustment problem, you can maybe go tax the rich to tide you over. But when your problem is that the engine of your society isn't turning over the way it used to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the problem is that manufacturing employment used to be 35%, it's going to 2%, and you've got to figure out what to do with all those people. All right, there aren't enough rich and they don't have enough money to cover this. And in fact, you, have, you really have to do the opposite in the sense that what we've got to do is we have to, cr we have to think about how do you have an economy mm -hmm. that can create jobs for the technical workers that are getting laid off, the clerical workers. The, so how do we provide an economy where if, you know, as you may know, we've got, um, you know, we're producing far more lawyers every year than we've got jobs in law school. So, so what else can these kids <laughs> do, you know? Um, we can't expect to sort of tax the rich to, to give them cradle to grave uh, livelihoods. So um, that's, that's a different kind of question. And I think if you think of, of our society as, as a place that urgently needs to encourage the creation of new jobs, mm -hmm. that implies less taxes on all kinds of economic activities. It implies a scaling back of mm -hmm. certain types of regulation. I think it also implies rethinking the relationship between, well, the, the, the state, the employer, and the employee. What we have, the blue model system was happiest when somebody is an employee of a large and stable right. corporation. That's, that's sort of yes, because then the corporation can tax the person. Right. Um, and you know can can pay the taxes to the government. You can handle a lot of of fringe benefits through the corporation. You don't need social policy. And in many ways, our tax system is set up to sort of make it a little harder for entrepreneurs and the self-employed. Mm -hmm. um, if you're a part-time worker, you often get zero health care. By the way, right. Obamacare is making this much worse. Yes, but um, you know. If you're not that kind of person, our, many of the basic institutions in our society don't work very well for you. And the trouble is, in this new economy, where there is less stable employment for lifetime, where more people will have part-time jobs, and where, in fact, many more people will have to create their own jobs or their own businesses, we have a regulatory structure that, if anything, inhibits Inhibit, that. Right. How do, you, how do you see the blue model ending? Well, hopefully in a, in a, not with a bang, a, but a whimper. Yeah, are we talking a, a crash, a crisis, a, a gradual enfeeblement, or how do you see it? I think what, you know, I think in some ways we're, we have been witnessing the decline of the blue model for some time. You know, everybody, every day somebody moves from Illinois to Texas. Mm -hmm. The blue model is sure. taking in a and sense from another California hit. to right. Texas, yeah, or Nevada or some other places. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I find fascinating is the mass uh, flight of African Americans from the big cities in the north. Many have moved to the south. Many are moving to the suburbs. But again, if the blue model were working, you would think that a welfare city state like Chicago or New York, if you were poor, you couldn't, you know, you couldn't stay away. I mean, you know, a magnet. Right. Not say, only will there be magnet, like yeah. social benefits and all that, but you know, there'd be wonderful schools by these creative blue bureaucrats who were, you know, taxing the rich to provide fantastic opportunity in the schools. Not only that, the job creation because their brilliant social planning would be just it would, there'd be fields of opportunity you couldn't stay away. And of course, in fact, in the 1920s and 30s, it was like yeah, that. Yeah. All right. But what you're seeing now is that the people who most need the benefits that the blue social model at its peak seriously tried to provide people are getting the heck away from, from blue model mm -hmm. jurisdictions. It's kind of weird. <laughs> So, Almost as if it didn't work. So, so, so you're betting on, so to speak, uh, a gradual decline and enfeeblement. Well, and I think, or do you think there'll be a bond crisis at some point, or? Uh... 
You know, look, if I had the answer to questions like that, I wouldn't be wasting my time getting interviewed here. I'd be in a little room <laughs> making such amazing <laughs> trades that I would own everything on earth soon. Or you know what I mean? It's it's I I'm not a I'm not a prescient financial guru. Alas. <laughs> Alas. But, um I think that I think America's uh, genius, and it's partly because we have the laboratory of 50 states where people try different things, it's partly because we are a culture committed to this idea of ordered liberty and, and real diversity and so on, that I think we'll probably muddle through. Mu not only muddle through, I think we'll probably muddle through a little faster than most other places do. One of America's big advantages historically has been as we come to these different crises where kind of society needs to change gear and, and, and step up its game to another level, all right? America gets to the new level faster and then everybody else is playing catch up mm -hmm. uh, while we are busily out there inventing the, the new game, the, the new way of doing it. I think that's where we're headed now. I certainly hope so. Thank you.